Uh, good morning, um, and can I welcome everybody to the 23rd meeting of the Education and Culture Committee in 2014. Uh, apologies have been received from Liam MacArthur and George Adam, uh, and can I welcome Joan McAlpine, who is attending in place of uh, George Adam. So welcome, Joan. Um, can I remind all those present, uh, would you mind making sure that all electron electronic devices, particularly mobile phones, are switched off, uh, because they do interfere with the uh, broadcasting system. Uh, today we will continue our discussion on the implementation of the new uh, national qualifications and, of course, the progress being made with Curriculum for Excellence more generally. Can I welcome to the committee uh, Michael Russell, Cabinet Secretary for Education and Lifelong Learning, uh, Fiona Robertson, Director of Learning at the Scottish Government, and Bill Maxwell, Chief Executive of Education Scotland. Uh, welcome to you all. We heard evidence uh, last week from a range of organisations in, in the education sector. Um, very interesting comments and discussion, I'm sure you'll agree. Um, but obviously that's the main focus of our discussion today uh, for the evidence from last week. Uh, also, I'm sure as the Cabinet Secretary will be aware, we did ask uh, members of the public to send in questions relating to the subject, and I'm sure we'll cover some of those um, from members as well. Uh, we've received quite a lot of questions and comments. We won't get through them all, but we will get through some of them, hopefully. Um, can I invite the Cabinet Secretary, therefore, to uh, get us underway by making some opening remarks? Cabinet Secretary. Thank you very much, Convener, and I'm delighted to be able to provide the Committee with an update on Curriculum for Excellence and the new national qualifications, and what has been, I think, for many of those in Scottish education, their hardest working year. Let me, if I might, Convener, start with a few reflections upon the journey we've undertaken with Curriculum for Excellence. Um, and as a reminder to start with the fact that Curriculum for Excellence wouldn't have been devised in the first place without the work of this committee's predecessor. In 2003, the then Education, Culture and Sport Committee took a long, hard look at Scotland's supposed educational primacy and accepted, difficult as it was, that our so-called gold standard system was somewhat tarnished. And I want to pay tribute to that committee and particularly to its convener, Karen Gillan, who was the driving force behind that inquiry. I had the great privilege of serving on that committee. Its report was amongst the most ambitious that the Parliament has ever produced, and it was the foundation stone for Curriculum for Excellence. That report set out ten objectives for Scottish education for the next two decades. And it's instructive to look back at those and to see all the work that has gone on to address them. I've actually asked my officials to submit a copy of the committee's report as part of my evidence today. I've also brought along with me as part of that evidence a, a short film made for the Scottish Learning Festival, which I'd also like to be part of my evidence today, and I have copies for each uh, member. Uh, because that makes the point about the progress that Scottish education has made and the work that is being undertaken. We are in a much stronger position today than we were in 2003. We have record exam results, record high number of school leavers in positive destinations, more new or refurbished schools, and the lowest teacher unemployment in the UK. And I pay tribute to my fellow committee members from that time, as well as to our four expert advisors, Sally Brown, Malcolm, the late Malcolm McKenzie, Lindsay Patterson and Keir Bloomer, on whose evidence we drew. Now, from the outset, the Curriculum for Excellence was that rare thing, a groundbreaking policy that had the support of all political parties. In my own time as Education Secretary, I want to recognise the role of the party spokespersons in taking this forward. Murdo Fraser, Liz Smith, uh, Des McNulty, Hugh Henry, Ken McIntosh, Margaret Smith, now Mary Scanlon, um, Liam MacArthur, uh, Patrick Harvey, um, Kezia Dugdale, all those people who have contributed to the success of this policy. There has been a constructive and collegiate approach, and in my view, uh, although we've differed on many things, it is really important that we continue together to support Curriculum for Excellence and Scottish Education. When I became Education Secretary in December 2009, I had my own questions about whether we were going to succeed with such a hugely ambitious programme. Yet, I, all the time I have seen throughout Scotland, in every school I've visited, what this, the tremendous enthusiasm for the new curriculum and the work that's gone into making it happen, including work by my own predecessor, Fiona Hislop. It has provided us with the best possible long-term plan for how we do education in Scotland. And that was the whole point of CFE. That was what was envisaged in 2003 by this committee. And it's a process, not an event. It's been going on for a considerable period of time, and it will continue to go on. And we'll learn as we go forward. Now, this year's exam diet was a major milestone for CFE. By any measure, it was a success. 
I think there's a general feeling that teachers who had worked exceptionally hard had come through it and learned fr from it, difficult as it was for some. Now, as the committee knows, I invited the Curriculum for Excellence Management Board to reflect on the implementation of those new qualifications, and I welcome the publication of their report in August. We'll continue to support teachers in delivering them. However, as Ken Muir said to the committee last week, it's the responsibility of everybody in the system to reduce over-assessment. For example, far more pupils were assessed for the National 4 Added Value Unit than was necessary, and that is a practical lesson we have now learned that in introducing these qualifications there was a degree of over-assessment and we can begin to withdraw from that and continue to develop the system. And we'll make further refinements based on what the data tells us. I've asked, as you know, the OECD to report in 2015 on the impact that Curriculum for Excellence is having. That work is going to be supported by the Royal Society of Edinburgh's Education Committee and we'll look closely at what it tells us. And we're supporting teachers in their professional development too. The new Scottish College for Educational Leadership is now up and running with a new chief executive, a new website, new fellowship programme available, and this is crucial to all teachers. Convener, some years ago I had the pleasure of meeting the German Federal Secretary for Education, and he joked over lunch that in his meetings with other education ministers, he was always able to spot those who were involved in introducing new curricula, simply because those were the most worried looking of all. There have been moments of worry in the last five years. But worry is a normal part of human life. So is effort, so is hard work, so is collaboration. And all those things have paid off and will go on paying dividends for our young people. There is an unstoppable momentum in our schools and a huge enthusiasm amongst teachers and pupils to keep on learning and improving. And with every milestone we reach, and we've just reached one, we're changing the culture of Scottish education and we're getting closer to realising that gold standard curriculum, which we had which we wanted to get back, which we envisaged getting back 11 years ago when this committee reported, and which we are now getting back. I welcome questions from the committee, of course, on these and no doubt many other points. Uh, thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary, um, for that opening statement. Can I begin the questioning this morning um, on the issue of communication? Um, now, the SQA submission to the committee referred to the organisation having provided comprehensive communication of existing key documents and resources, etc. Um, however, the EIS said to us that, uh, that the CFE Management Board and SQA had failed to communicate key messages. Um, EIS referred to poor communication, uh, as, did, uh, as did some others. In your view, could you expand on... Uh, the comments or the differing views on communication of these different organisations, and also if you accept that there has been some failure in communication, particularly with teachers, how we would improve that? Uh, yes, uh, of course. DIS was part of the management board, and, and, and I think all organisations had a, a collective responsibility for communication, but it can always improve. I, I was very struck by something Terry Lanigan said in, in evidence to you last week that he said, and I want to quote him, that I'm quite clear, having worked in education for 37 years, that there's been no initiative in Scottish education during that time about which there's been more communication or more support. Now, I do think that that is a fair reflection. But, of course, where there are failures in communication at cru crucial pressure points, then we need to improve them. I think the EIS has drawn attention, and you're aware of this from evidence uh, and from your reading, has drawn attention, for example, to communications between the SQA and some of the teaching professions, some schools. We want to continue to improve that. <laughs> there is, uh, there's both external and internal communications. There is an ex in external communication plan, a single one, for CFE, and that's something I insisted upon and which I think has worked. And we've been able to communicate the information about CFE successfully, uh, essentially from all the organisations. Internally, I think we continue to refine the internal communications between the parts of the whole. And I think the SQA now is fully embedded in that process in a way perhaps it wasn't a year ago. And that will continue through the rollout of the hires. But I stressed in my opening remarks that this has been a learning experience. I think that communication is improving, has improved, and I'm glad that people like Terry Lanigan see that it has been, by and large, successful. OK, thank you very much for that. Uh, Jane Baxter. Thank you. Um, morning. Morning. One of the things that, that um, witnesses reflected to us last week was that um, being provided with information is not the same as becoming knowledgeable. And some comments were made about knowing what to look for on websites and getting the information you need. 
And I'd just like to extend that a little bit to um, what parents are saying, because I did a little bit of my own Facebook research convener. I put the report from last week on my Facebook page, and a number of parents have contacted me. Um, and one of them said that um, she had engaged with the school and had gone to all the meetings and had received a lot of documentation and reports, but she wasn't convinced that parents who had a poor educational experience themselves or those who face other barriers to engaging with schools would, would gain much from, from that process. So can you comment on how that might be improved and what, what other things schools and educationists mm. in general could do to, to make information mm. translate into knowledge? Yes, I think it's a good point. Uh, the involvement of parents in, in their children's learning is absolutely crucial to success, and we recognise that. And there's a number of routes that we follow and have followed in CFE. One is the collaborative partnership we've had with the, the, the Parents Forum, and that's been very strong indeed, and I pay tribute to Ian Ellis and his colleagues who have worked with us every step of the way, and they are represented on the management board. So they've taken a, a keen interest in making sure information is, it gets to parents, and indeed I've been to quite a number of their events, as has Alistair Allen, in which we've discussed with parents how we improve communication with parents. So, And we, we'll go on doing that, but the Parent Forum has been crucial to it, that the right type of information gets out. Last year we published a leaflet on CFE, which I think the committee has had, but I'm happy to, to distribute copies of it again, jointly with the Parent Forum that had case studies, um, and it was very, very helpful to a lot of parents because it explained exactly what people could expect. So that's the collaborative element within that. Uh, but of course, we also there's a responsibility in individual schools for communication, and as part of the wider improvement work we're doing and the improvement partnerships that we're engaged in, the focus on parental involvement in school is quite crucial. Um, and indeed, I can think of a school I've re visited recently, Wester Hales, where uh, the school is very focused indeed on making sure, essentially, that no parent escapes the opportunity of being involved with the school. Now, sometimes, as you say, uh, parents themselves have less than happy memories of being at school uh, and find school a difficult place to relate to. And that needs to be uh, essentially understood within the practice of the school as they communicate with parents. That job will never be done by definition, but I do think we, we are continuing to improve how we do it, both in collaboration with parent organisations and also with a strong focus in the improvement partnership work. Just briefly, Convina, thanks for that. Um, I, I would just add that I, I really hope that the, the, the scope to use social media as much as possible is used because I'm finding through my experience that that's a, a method that works. But just moving on from that, um, I think employers also need to get the, the knowledge they need um, and I think there is a little bit of confusion and, and lack of understanding of the new qualifications with employers. So my question is the same. What, what do you envisage needing to be improved just to make those levels of satisfaction greater? Very strong work with employers, both again on a national basis and on, also on the school local basis. Uh, and we can give you some examples of that if, if you so wish. Um, I've actually been quite pleased with the level of employer engagement. Uh, I think that has been more, cons uh, more comprehensive than we had thought even a couple of years ago. The actual changes in what the qualifications mean are not too difficult to understand. You know, the higher qualification remains in place. Uh, the advanced higher qualification remains in place. Uh, the national four and five qualifications are probably harder to get across. But we seem to have succeeded in getting those across through a variety of events, stakeholder events, through a variety of communication means. But it, it, the job's not done, and we'll continue to do it. But I think we've seen some positive interaction. We've also had that from another key group, which is colleges and universities, where we've worked closely with the, uh, colleges and universities who are you know, essentially receiving young people from school so that they understand what the qualifications are, they can fit them into their own expectations. Uh, University of Scotland issued a very strong and helpful statement last year that codified the uh, approach of universities. The colleges have been very positive. Indeed, the colleges see curriculum for excellence as very much reflecting the way in which they work. And uh, I also met earlier this year the Russell Group of Universities um, south of the border uh, who didn't know much about curriculum for excellence but have taken a very positive and strong stance. But also, helpfully, due to the work of the two Scottish members of the Russell Group, uh, Anton Muscatelli and, and, and Tim O'Shea. Thank you. 
do you see all of that contributing towards implementation of the Wood Report and the absolutely what, what is what is bound into this? Uh, you know, the wood, a lot of the Wood recommendations are really dependent upon the continuing implementation of CFE and the development of CFE across the board. Uh, so, in those circumstances, yes, Wood 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 grows out of the deeper, broader learning that is curriculum for excellence. And we're, you know, Angela Constance and I are working very closely on implementing that with great enthusiasm, I have to say. I think it's a, another big step forward for Scottish education. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Uh, Gordon MacDonald. Okay, thanks very much, Convener. Uh, I wanted to ask about the culture change required uh, within the teaching profession uh, in order to ensure that Curriculum for Excellence is a success. Um, I've got a couple of, or three quotes I wanted to read out to you, um, uh, all from last week's evidence session. Uh, Dr Janet Brown is Scottish Qualification Authority. One of the fundamental principles of Curriculum for Excellence was that it should allow teachers to take back ownership and to use a professional judgment in creating a culture and a curriculum that is interesting and tailored to individuals. However, Richard Goring of the Scottish Secondary Teachers Association said, the majority of secondary teachers have had the content, the syllabus and all that stuff there for them over the years but suddenly they have to reinvent a lot of it themselves. That is not the experience that they had in the past, and it will take some time to change that. And finally, <laughs> Ken Muir of the General Teaching Council, we still have some way to go with teachers' understanding and head teachers' understanding, in some cases, of the basic philosophy of what Curriculum for Excellence is trying to achieve. So, so my question is, how will the Scottish Government ensure that the cultural change required to meet the aspirations of cu Curriculum for Excellence is fully embedded in Scottish education? It, it's a very good question, and it, it goes to the heart of what Curriculum for Excellence seeks to achieve in terms of broader and deeper learning. Um, one of the key lessons that comes out of both Finland and Ontario, two of the big long-term examples of positive educational change, uh, there's a remarkable consistency uh, and the, the, the consistent message is in two parts. One is that you need a long-term approach to educational policy. If you have constant chopping and changing, if you have education ministers that have five good ideas before breakfast you know, and don't stick with a long-term change, then you don't succeed as well. And the second one is that you have to trust teachers to teach. You know, it, is, it is investing in the teaching profession in the long term and trusting mm -hmm. teachers to teach that makes the difference. Now, I'm, very, I'm absolutely uh, fixated upon making sure that we do those things. Our long-term approach is curriculum for excellence. You know, we, we, we we've taken this on. We're carrying on with it. It's continuing to roll out. Not, it will never be finished. It's our process. So that's our long-term approach. And our investment in teachers continues to grow. And it's implicit in Curriculum for Excellence and explicit that it is teachers that uh, teachers taking responsibility is key. Now, I think the union point of view is, 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 is correct. It takes time for that to happen. Younger teachers, I don't want to make absolute generalisations because I know many older teachers who have adapted to it uh, very, very quickly and very, very well. But younger teachers find it easier coming out of college uh, to do so because they are inspired by it and see the opportunities of it. That's why we have such a, a growth in well-qualified young people who want to be teachers. And we should note that. It is very, very impressive indeed, the qualifications of our, our young teachers. So they get involved in it, they want to deliver it, and they take responsibility for it. But it takes a bit of time. And that's why we've tried to support. Now, for example, one of the changes we made during the programme, one of the refinements we made to health, was at a certain stage, uh, Larry Flanagan, in, in, uh, who was the, not the General Secretary of the EIS, but was uh, on the management board and leading this process, said to me that he believed that what we had to do was to make sure that teachers had more materials available to them that had been developed by other teachers to help them. Now, we set in process, and Ken Muir, actually, when he was working for Education Scotland, was the key to this. <coughs> Ken Muir became the sort of um, librarian, exchange librarian, of all those schemes that were, and materials that were building up across Scotland and got them provided from one local authority to another, from one school to another. And we were able to provide an awful lot of things that we hadn't done. So we are in a process of culture change. We're in a process of culture change that is and has been difficult for some teachers. But the whole programme is designed to support that change and to make it happen. And interesting to note some statistics on this. The implementation plan, you know, which, which Bill is responsible for, uh, 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 has said uh, uh, it includes the professional associations, and it, there's an absolute agreement there 
that changing the culture of the curriculum and achieving the principles and aspirations are at the heart of what we need to do. Statistically, again, and, and Bill's organisation, 90% of schools inspected in the last year had a key strength around young people's learning, motivation, positive attitudes and engagement. 90%. Now that shows that the power of good teaching is taking place. So I, I think the culture change is taking place. One other culture change convenience that's important. We are moving from a curriculum model of 2 plus 2 plus 2, which is essentially the model that we see on most schools, to a 3 plus 3. But culture change doesn't take place overnight. One of the, one of the mistakes, perhaps, in starting off in this programme was the assumption that you could change from 2 plus 2 plus 2 to 3 plus 3 just like that in every school in Scotland. That, that couldn't happen. We've seen it, but there is that process of change taking place, uh, and that process of change is now moving forward very radically to make sure that we have that 3 plus 3 model. Now, that is, there is an organic nature in culture change as well as a, a directional uh, an implementation of culture change. You, you said that um, culture change doesn't take place overnight, and you know, I'm keen to understand in the short term, uh, SQA, um, prior to this set of qualifications, uh, had 390 events across Scotland supporting thousands of teachers. Is that something you see being replicated over? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Education Scotland drew together every secondary head teacher in Scotland. Am I right in saying? Yeah. Do you want to say a word about how that worked, and then I can talk about the SKA one? Yeah, because uh, I mean, alongside Curriculum for, for Excellence sits the Teaching Scotland's Future Agenda, which is absolutely about building teacher professionalism, but also about strengthening leadership. And part of what we've been doing around that is running, as Cabinet Secretary said, we ran conferences, which had an invite to every secondary school in Scotland for conferences around the country. Uh, before the summer. We're now repeating that in primary as it happens, actually, because we see leadership as being absolutely crucial uh, to taking forward uh, innovative ideas which are emerging now increasingly strongly in the system, uh, which we can then spread and cross-fertilise across the system, because I, I like the SQA has, has done something very similar. It's broken it down on subject mm -hmm. level. You know, I, I hope most teachers in Scotland over a period of time get the chance to interact with their peers in, in these gatherings. But there's also tremendous local interaction taking place as well in local authorities and school clusters, and all of that is contributing to that profound culture change, which is creating great enthusiasm. I mean, I, you know, I don't know if any members of the committee got to the Learning Festival at all, but the Learning Festival year and year seems to me to be growing in enthusiasm and commitment from teachers who are energised by this process. Now, it's not without difficulty. You know, but but it, people are seeing how important this is. Thanks very much. Um, Colin Beatty. Thank you, Convener. Cabinet Secretary, last week um, I raised the question of workload uh, in relation to CFE with the panel, and uh, there seems to be a general agreement that indeed CFE did generate uh, a certain amount of additional workload for teachers. Now, there's a couple of questions arising out of that. One of the reasons, that, the major reason it was identified for that was over-assessment. In retrospect, was there a way to avoid that aspect of the, of the workload or to reduce that, uh, or was it an inevitability given the, given the whole process? And secondly, there seemed to be a general agreement last week that uh, workload in relation to CFE would reduce, but... There was, seemed to be an uncertainty as to whether there might be some residual additional workload. And is there extra workload that's integral to CFE, or is that not the case? Well, I, I think we have to understand, insofar as we can, um, why there was over-assessment. And I think you know, there's no doubt there was over-assessment. I think the newness of the system had something to do with it. Teachers are naturally ambitious for their pupils. They did not want their pupils to suffer or have potentially failed, and therefore they went several extra miles in terms of assessment, which I think they will step back from slightly on, on this occasion, uh, on the next occasion. And I think over a period of years we will see more confidence in that. Uh, there was also some concern taking place about the nature of the National Four qualification, which of course is not externally uh, assessed, uh, and that was criticised, and I think teachers wanted to make sure that they did that as well as they possibly could. Uh, the changes to assessment were, were undertaken during the session that the SQA undertook, listening to representations from ES and others, I think will make a difference. 
Um, and we want to ensure it makes a difference. So I indicated in my remarks this morning that I will want um, to be assured that the assessment pressures do not increase and indeed that they decrease over the next 12 months and, and, and in each examination diet thereafter. Um, we have also taken very seriously the issue of workload more widely. I announced at the EIS uh, AGM in 2013 the, the group on workload, which has been meeting over the last year. It has produced a report which is effective. It needs to get into everybody's hands. Jane Baxter's point about communication is, is undoubtedly true there. We need to make sure that e every teacher knows about that and every school knows about that. We need every local authority to collaborate on that. We need to hold our own hands sometimes in terms of seeking statistics or information so that we're not contributing unnecessarily to workload. Um, there was a tendency in some local authorities, and I know the convener raised this in the earlier session, uh, to require all or nearly all N5 candidates to complete the added value unit. I, I think we all realise that that's not necessary and that, that we'll step back from that too. But I think we're making progress in this. I, I have a regular meeting with each of the trade unions, and last week was a week in which I met with some of them, um, including NASUWT. And in my discussions with NASUWT, uh, again, and workload always comes up in these meetings, I also pointed to the responsibility on the unions to make sure that the commitments that have been entered into in the workload group are honoured by local authorities, by school, by school management, uh, and unions have a key role to disseminate information on workload too. So I think we are making progress and the assessment burden will reduce over the next 12 months and we want it to reduce over the next 12 months. Would it be correct to say that additional workload isn't integral to CFE. Yes, and I've said that publicly, and I said that uh, in the remarks I made at the AS AGM in 2013. I said that it's absolutely not integral to it. Indeed, uh, if, you, if we trust teachers to teach, then there should be a reduction, particularly in the unnecessary bureaucracy in the system. Uh, there's often in any bureaucratic system belts, more belts, more braces than you actually need. And getting those out of the system is important. I used the example in my EIS speech of, 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 of work plans that teachers are required to submit, which are never looked at by, by, by heads of department or head teachers. We need to take that nonsense out of the system completely. Now, local authorities, teaching unions, government, individual <coughs> teachers, SQA, Education Scotland, everybody working together to reduce workload and to make sure that there is not over-assessment. I think that is positive. Um, Neil Bibby. Thanks, Kevin. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Morning. Um, you mentioned, um, obviously, that, that there have been worries expressed by teachers, and of course, earlier this year, teaching unions had said they'd never experienced so much uh, anger, frustration, and disappointment with the exams authority as they uh, were currently uh, witnessing. We, we've um, obviously asked teachers for some um, parents and pupils for some um, questions ahead of this uh, this morning. I'm just going to ask some questions on, on their behalf. Um, firstly, from a, a principal physics teacher, um, why not postpone the cessation of the old advanced hire for a year so that pupils who are following the old hire will have a continuous experience? The new CFE advanced hire is significantly different. Um, pupils who follow the old hire will be disadvantaged. How would you uh, respond to that, teacher? I've been very open to discussion of both higher and advanced higher and flexibility in these circumstances. We offered flexibility in the higher as required by schools in circumstances which they could define, and that was very positive indeed. In terms of advanced higher, I think it is less likely that in this process that that will be a major pressure. But if any school found itself in an impossible situation, we'd be listening, as we're always listening to these circumstances. We don't think that there's a need for dual running of the advanced hire. This is, you know, we've taken quite a lot of pressure out of the system with the, 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 the much more flexible view on the hire. The advanced hire is pretty intense no matter which curriculum you, you follow. Uh, and in those circumstances, I think it's unlikely that there would be the need for a, a final change in that regard. But, you know, I'm always willing to have conversations. I've spent you know, much time sitting down and talking to teachers about these issues and will continue to do so. And thank you for your commitment to listen. Obviously, you know, teachers are raising uh, the concerns about the possible uh, disadvantage it could bring to, to pupils. Another um, physics teacher um, has said, I, I greatly appreciate the 
extra inset days allocated to prepare resources for implementation of the new curriculum. However, too many of the resources that I produced on these days are now redundant as the SQA has continuously changed the guidelines. I attended a meeting in February where the SQA assured the community of physics teachers that there would be no changes to the guidelines after April 2014. They stated that changes may be made after the 2015 exam date. This has not been the case across uh, the range of levels. Changes have been made across the whole of the secondary curriculum over the recent months, with the most recent being published at the end of September 2014. This physics teacher has asked, can the government intervene to prevent the SQA making further changes to the curriculum, or that when changes are made, they are not for the current teaching session, but for future sessions? Well, no. And, and, and I think if you think about it for a moment, there's a good reason for that. And, and there is, well, it's two good reasons. One is we don't set, set curricula. You know, I, I don't think you would want me, Mr Bibby, to start interfering in the physics, what is taught in the physics classroom. But the reality of the situation here is the SQA have made changes where those changes have been either requested by or seem to be essential because of the views of classroom teachers themselves. You know, the SQA is not spending time dreaming up ways in which it can change things, but it is trying to be, and indeed this is a request of teachers, it's a request of the IS, it's trying to be as responsive as it can be. Now, I think to some extent the problem is that some teachers experienced in the early part of this year were because it was being too responsive from time to time. It was, it was trying to listen to every single point that was put. And I do agree that there's a point at which we say, no, that's it, it's done, it's set, and that's what we're going to go ahead with. But, you know, I, I, I know the SQA well. I know they're trying to be responsive. I think it's much better to allow them to be responsive. But certainly when teachers think there's too much change, they need to say so directly to the SQA. One of the purposes of all these meetings that have been held is to give the opportunity for teachers to say directly to the SQA, hang on a minute, you know, we think this and we think that. So they should take those opportunities. Um, another question that's been raised by um, a science teacher is, why, um, why do people who have not been in a classroom for years think that subjects such as biology and physics can be taught at N4 and N5 in the same classroom? They are totally different courses. What would you say to that teacher? Well, I think a teacher who finds it difficult to teach in those circumstances should first of all talk to their head of department and then to their head teacher. There may be reasons why that is necessary in that school for a period of time. You know, I'm not likely to know those reasons in every single classroom. There may be opportunities for mixing those classes at certain times. You know, that is what the teacher needs to discuss with the head of department, the head teacher, with the parents of the pupils involved and with the pupils themselves because participation of pupils in deciding on their own learning is extremely important and that is how decisions will be reached. There's a sort of parallel in something else which you may come up later on today which is the number of subjects that, that are taken in a school. One of the most interesting discussions I've had with this is a group of, with a group of pupils at Rothsey Academy, my own constituency, who felt that taking eight was too many and wanted a change to take place and explained why that change should take place. I think you know, young people taking National 4, National 5, let alone taking hires, should be influencing their own learning, and that is a collaborative and collective decision within a school. I, I thank you for your answer. I, I just obviously don't think that they are isolated incidents. I think we're hearing you know, more and more you know, concerns along these lines. Um, in March 2012, you said, Cabinet Secretary, um, I do not believe that any teacher in Scotland who has the right support, right help and right leadership, which will come from the government, from Education in Scotland, from the local authority and from within their school, cannot rise to the challenge and deliver the conclusion of a programme that has been eight years in the making. Uh, why then are we hearing uh, last week um, that at least a third of courses will be um, delivered in the existing hire this year? Is it because, as the EIS have said, uh, their survey said that uh, support for the new hire was ranked as excellent by 1% of teachers and poor by 65% of teachers. Well, Mr Perry, I think it's a little strange to criticise now the flexibility that exists on the hire um, as being inconsistent with my confidence in the programme. I believed throughout this process that the support that we should give to teachers was and schools was paramount. That's why repeatedly uh, in my time as Cabinet Secretary, I've brought forward additional support, why I've always offered it to the unions, why I've had big discussions with Education Scotland, with my colleagues in, in the civil service and others, to make sure the maximum support is provided. 
Now, um, my view last year was on the hire that the, the pressure was, did not need to be so great, having got through the first diet, and that there was an argument for those who had genuine difficulties or concerns to have dual running for the hire, because dual running would exist for the hire anyway, because of the system that existed. And in those circumstances, I gave that flexibility. It is not a lack of confidence in the programme. It is a part of the support for teachers. And I'm glad that that has been taken up constructively in a variety of places. Let's just reflect where we are presently. You know, I'm glad you quoted me in 2012, because I think, uh, frankly, I was right. And I think the quotes I've got in front of me from people who commented on the diet indicate that I was right. That in actual fact, we've had a successful introduction. We've got a lot more work to do, but we've had that successful introduction. And if we keep our heat and we make sure that we continue to support teachers, then we'll get through the hires, the introduction of the hires, and then the new advanced hires, and we'll continue with CFE. Now, I think that prediction, to be absolutely um, uh, honest about it, turned out to be correct, but that was because we all worked together on it, and we should work together on it. How can you assert that teachers have had the right support, the right help, and the right leadership when over a third, at least a third, I don't, we don't actually know the exact figures of courses will be provided in the existing hire. How can you say that you've provided because the Because right the effort? flexibility exists to have either the existing hire or the new hire. That's a necessary flexibility within the system. Uh, you know, and, we, and, and I feel that that's the right flexibility in the system, and it was welcomed by the teaching trade unions as well as by a wide range of others. So uh, I, I don't know anybody who believes that's not the right thing to happen. But, you know, if I can quote um, a, a, a Jane, uh, uh, Richard Goring of the SSTA to you, we were absolutely delighted that the National Four and National Five results were as positive as we there. Uh, you know, Jane Peckin of the NUS UWT, in terms of getting the voices of the profession heard, for example, on this matter, being part of the management board certainly allows us to take forward the profession's views. Again and again, people are being positive about the experience, not saying it's perfect, not saying it isn't without stress and difficulty, because it has been, you know, but making sure that we're delivering something highly significant for Scotland's young people and for the future of Scotland. Well, you said the, the, the right support, right help and right leadership would come. We have teachers uh, saying that that, that that didn't come. Um, we also have the Royal Society um, of Edinburgh um, saying that uh, there has been a, a lack of systematic strategy for the implementation of curriculum for excellence. I see you're smiling and I don't, I don't, I don't think that's... Well, I, I don't, I don't agree. Man. I don't actually agree with that. So I'm quite happy to debate that with Sally Brown, you know, who was one of the expert advisors to uh, uh, the committee ten years ago. I don't agree with that. I've told Sally to her face. I don't agree with that. I think there was and remains a systematic strategy. But the interesting thing about that, Mr. Bibby, is that I've invited the Royal Society of Edinburgh Education Committee to be part of the OECD process to look at uh, a, a, a curriculum for excellence implementation. I'm inviting them in to be part of the process to make sure that we do understand what's taken place. So I welcome their input, and we'll have that useful debate. But, but let's, let's, um, let's look at, for example, the teacher and secondary pupil questionnaire that Education in Scotland have undertaken, the pre-inspection questionnaires. 8,470 questionnaires issued between April 2012 and March 2014. 73% response rate. 87% agree or strongly agree that they have regular opportunities to help shape the curriculum. 89% agree or strongly agree they have good opportunities for continuing professional development. I could go on. There are a range of positive views of the work that has been done. Now, I, I am with you, Mr. Bibby, on the issue of the fact that this can be difficult and has been difficult. It has not been perfect. Uh, 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 no work of human hand is perfect. But I think that there has been genuine good work undertaken across the board, by this committee, uh, right through to schools, to individuals, and that has produced results, and that's what we intend to go on doing. Um, the Royal Society for Edinburgh also talk about um, a lack of pilot trials and independent evaluation, and also mention that um, a state that's curriculum for excellence is not being managed holistically. Uh, what do you have to say to that? The point of view that they can bring into the OECD assessment. Again, I, I think in terms of managing it holistically, I'm not entirely sure what they mean. On pilot trials, 
uh, I'm happy to defend the process that we undertook, uh, and very vigorously, uh, uh, and for the reason I don't think you can pilot a new curriculum of this nature. There was a cross-party agreement in 2003, which I've drawn attention to, that the Scottish education needed to change. There was an agreement that that needed to change over a school generation. That is what all the parties agreed that would happen. That is what happened. And it started in 2004, and it has continued now, and it's got a couple of years to go until the full rollout has taken place. If you'd piloted this in one place, you'd have created inconsistencies of qualification. You'd have created inconsistencies of expectation. I think it was right to do it in the way that it was done. In terms of evaluation, I have always said, again, and I know you quote my words often, so no doubt you'll find the quote that said it. I have repeatedly said that I felt the right time to evaluate this was after we had had the, the, the first major diet when the thing was essentially established. And it was not a good idea to indulge in piecemeal evaluation until that time. The moment that we had that, then indeed last year I anticipated it in my speech at the Learning Festival and said we would bring in the most significant outside body I could find, which was the OECD, to look at this with a, a global reputation. But we would also root it within educational experience in Scotland. That's why I invited the Royal Society of Edinburgh Education Committee to be essentially the, the supporters of that process. And I'm very happy that that is taking place. And that will be an interesting set of conclusions they will reach. And they will report on, in December 2015. And no doubt this committee will want to be part both of that evaluation and of deciding what's next. We have we have teachers that have never been so angry and frustrated, uh, feeling unsupported. We have anxious and worried parents and uh, pupils. We have the Royal Society of Edinburgh complaining of a lack of systematic strategy for its implementation and saying it's not been managed holistically. Um, you have accepted there has been mistakes made in the process. You have said that there has been over-assessment. As the man who's ultimately responsible, would you like to apologise to the teachers, parents and pupils for what's going on? No, what I would like to do is just to pay tribute to everybody who's worked so hard. Everybody has worked hard on this and it's been tough for a lot of different people. But in those circumstances, we've done something that is worthwhile and is producing results for the young people of Scotland. I've maintained a positive attitude during all of this. And I've tried to make sure that whatever we did was helpful to teachers and to schools. I contrast that attitude, Mr Bibby, reluctantly contrast that, with the words of Kezia Dugdale in, in Parliament on the 18th of March, which said, I blame the Cabinet Secretary. It will be his responsibility when this goes wrong. I think that was probably the most unhelpful thing I heard in the whole period that I've been involved in CFE. Because what has determined the success of this has been, despite disputes about methodologies and about individual issues, what has determined the success of this is a willingness to make sure that this goes right and to work hard together to make sure this goes right. Now, I hope that was a single example, and I hope what we could return to was positive approaches. You and I can debate and discuss uh, you know, till the cows come home the actual individual issues. But CFE is a good thing which many, many people have worked together to make a success. And I'm grateful to every single one of them, including, as I said earlier, the opposition spokespeople with whom I have disagreed. There, of course, have been things that have went wrong, uh, Cabinet Secretary. I don't think anyone uh, would dispute that. Uh, you've mentioned earlier you've been the Cabinet Secretary since 2009. You are the man who's ultimately responsible for Scottish education, there has been a great deal of uh, mismanagement of, of the implementation of curriculum for excellence over the past uh, couple of years. This is your responsibility. Do you accept that you've made mistakes? Do you have regrets? Or is it, is it other people's fault? Everybody who has been involved in this process has made mistakes. Everybody can think of things that they would want to do differently. I suspect that's true of yourself and Kezia Dugdale, for example. Kezia Dugdale should not have said uh, when this goes wrong. But, you know, what we do every day is get up in the morning and say, let's make the best we can of Scottish education. That applies to everybody in Scottish education. And it is that attitude that is creating the circumstances in which Curriculum for Excellence is succeeding and will succeed. 
I think, to be honest, Mr. Bibby, you should try to be part of that. Try to be part of that success, not will its failure. Thank you very much. Uh, Claire Adamson. Um, thank you. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Morning. Um, you touched it on a couple of issues already that are to do with the sort of general principles of CFE and embedding those in the future, um, uh, particularly the 3 plus 3 model of teaching, which I've already um, talked a little about. Um, but one of the other concerns is the principle about the, the number of subjects that are being chosen, and you've mentioned the pupils who contributed to that debate too. Um, do you think there's more work to be done in terms of um, explaining that a reduction in the number of subjects does not necessarily mean a reduction in the curriculum and learning experience of young people and and how will that be communicated to um, parents and carers and the wider community uh, in terms of employers um, I, I was particularly concerned that the, the Royal Society evidence last week suggested that the reduction in the number of subjects was an issue with curriculum for excellence but uh, in my mind, it's, it's a general principle that mm. it's the breadth and the experience of the young people and the outcomes that are important. So if you could just touch on those general principles again with a bit more detail. Yeah, I, I, I sort of, I, I've heard the, the, the individual who's been involved with the Royal Society that says this repeatedly is Kerr Bloomer. And of course, he was, you know, the, the father of curriculum for excellence. And I know it's been a concern of his. I, I would advise him to talk to, to some pupils about this. I mean, I think the most interesting experience you get out of this is talking to young people about their expectations. Um, and I go back to those, those pupils in Rothsey, and it was a very interesting experience. They stick particularly strongly in the mind, because it's been a question over you know, a, a, the long period of time, all the time I've been Cabinet Secretary, this has been a question. Uh, is there in any sense a reduction uh, if you're talking about five or six subjects you know, in, in, a, in a single year? And when you talk about pupils, about the, the, the stress on pupils and, 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 and the pressure on pupils, they are absolutely clear that what they want is to be able to work intensively on a smaller number of subjects rather than more thinly on a wider range of subjects. Uh, and it applies not just to the pressure of examination or assessment. It applies to all the coursework that takes place and the, the, the regular issues within coursework. So I think there is no diminution because there is no reduction over a period of time. Um, and as a result of that, I think the, the right number is running out somewhere five, six, seven-ish. I think eight is very high and an exceptional one. One of the pressures on this has been parental expectation. Well, it is important that parents understand why this change isn't a diminution. We are all, to some extent, the prisoners of the educational experience that we have had. You know, this is a different type of, uh, of education. And in those circumstances, I think over a period of time this will resolve itself. I'd be surprised, I think, although I'm often prepared to be surprised, but I'd be surprised, and Bill might just confirm this, whether uh, in actual fact the trend will not be over the next year to two years of a reduction from eight in those places where there are eight uh, down to six or seven. Would... Yep. <coughs> Indeed, we're seeing a strong trend towards that as schools are now really beginning to rethink their whole curriculum model I think the kind of isolated focus on what happens in S4 can be a bit misleading. I mean, we need to bear in mind, for example, that in S3 now, young people are studying a broader curriculum than ever before to a higher standard across a whole range of subjects. And we're then looking then at how they follow through into the three years of the senior phase. And what matters really is what their cumulative yeah. achievement and study is by the end of that whole six-year journey, indeed building on primary. Uh, so, as I say, uh, there's a lot of very interesting uh, thinking going on. Schools are beginning to really exploit the potential of the senior phase. Uh, and there will be different pathways for different young people. Uh, again, I think we're moving away from a one-size-fits-all notion that all pupils must do the same number of subjects in the same year uh, towards something that's much more customised to the individual, individual's needs. One thing that we shouldn't forget is the trajectory that runs directly into higher and doesn't necessarily run through uh, National 5. Um, that's a discussion that we need to have. It is not yet common, but there are, there are many head teachers who are discussing this in a constructive way. Uh, and I think we shouldn't, you know, Curriculum for Excellence is, as I said, a process. Things will continue to change. Ideas will change. And I've had a, had a very interesting discussion with a half a, well, about a dozen head teachers um, uh, in May, uh, late May, early June, 
about how that would be a developing model, they thought, uh, for many pupils, and that's, that changes things too. Um, Mary Scallon. <coughs> Just on that subject, and, and I, I hear what you're saying, um, is, is it not the case that has been raised um, by many of the submissions that we've had that, uh, you know, I can understand the, the depth of learning, I appreciate all that, but it's more about the breadth of opportunities in terms of career and the options for career. So moving from eight subjects down to five or six, is there, uh, you know, could that possibly be limiting careers? And if I could perhaps just tie that in with, Neil Bibby mentioned quite a bit on physic, uh, uh, physics, and in our comments from Facebook and Twitter, uh, the physics teachers were uh, uh, had quite a lot to say. But they did say that uh, the sciences and physics in particular seems to have been made more difficult. So what I'm asking is the reduction in the number of subjects does that limit options? And does it, given that physics and other science subjects seem to have been particularly critical of uh, CFE this year, uh, is that likely to reduce the numbers taking those subjects at schools, going on to university at a time where I know that we're all uh, committed to having more women coming into the STEM subjects? I think it's a good question. Uh, and I think that the answer cannot be given for one cohort alone. There will be many different opportunities. Generally, I don't think it reduces opportunity. I don't think it reduces uh, choice. I think a school will encourage the widest possible choice uh, and will keep those choices open for uh, a, a long period of time. And I think that's probably what this system does. Uh, it would be important, I think, that we show you in more depth, perhaps, some of the examples that we used in the leaflet with the Scottish with the Parent uh, Forum last year, because they showed a variety of different examples of career pathways which were different and were chosen differently in different circumstances. For example, somebody who was studying for a variety of N4s and N5s, you know, there are some learning pathways, a variety of learning pathways that come out of that. Uh, they could leave school for work, do a modern apprenticeship, complete an HNC as part of a modern apprenticeship at college, and then perhaps matriculate into university. You know, so there, there are opportunities there. Uh, there's an opportunity to bypass N5s, in which case the issue doesn't arise. That's a, a, an earlier selection, with a, a number of selections being made for hires and that trajectory being taken. Um, there's the N for an N5 route for young people who will then want to make a decision as a result of that of whether they do more subjects at a lower level or whether they, 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 they take the number of subjects at the higher level, possibly even at the advanced higher level. So I don't think there is a reduction in opportunity and we would keep ourselves alive to that because pathways should be kept wide open for as long as possible. Um, in terms of science and physics, I mean, I think there has been... Of all the subjects, I think physics is the one that's expressed the most concern over the last two years. I mean, I've met a number of physics teachers, so has Alistair Allen. I can understand that. The particular nature of the subject perhaps lends it to that. But we are alive to the fact that we need to continue to offer uh, the sciences as broadly as possible, and we will continue to do that. I think we should always be aware that we need young people to be scientists, to be engineers, uh, you know, to be physicists. I, I met, um, I opened the new uh, a, a Mern's Academy on Friday, and I met two inspirational young people in their sixth year, both of whom were going to study physics at, at, at university. And when I talked to them about it, it was the influence of their physics teacher, almost more than anything else, that had created those circumstances. So whoever the physics teachers at Mern's Academy should take a bow, or physics teachers, for that. So we need to encourage that broadly. We also need to encourage, as you will know, the languages options. Um, and I think Curriculum for Excellence has been helpful in allowing a broader choice of languages plus the one plus two. So I'm mindful of this, the, the importance of your question. I think we should remain mindful that we don't limit opportunities. But I think if we could share with you some of the pathways information, I think you would see that those options are remaining open. 
That's very helpful. I'm, I'm pleased to hear that you are mindful and you're keeping an eye on the sciences because they do seem to have been uh, very vocal in the past year. Uh, just a very short question. You did say to um, uh, uh, Gordon MacDonald <clears throat> that we have to trust teachers to teach. And uh, one of the questions and comments from Facebook and Twitter says, when will the government stop meddling and allow teachers to teach? You know, have, have we got the right balance here? Um, I don't think we've ever had a system that encourages teachers to take responsibility for their own teaching greater than the system we've got. Um, you know, we have a very clear system in Scotland now. CFE encourages teachers to teach uh, essentially in their way, uh, in, in, with, to their full professionalism. And we have a very clear registration system, which is absolutely clear. The standards for registration are clear and transparent. I think that frees teachers... Absolutely. You know, there's always a balance to be struck. You know, we, I believe that we're, we're freeing teachers in such a way, but you've also heard parallel complaints about not supporting teachers I enough. So there always will be a balance. But I am a strong advocate, as you know, of freeing teachers to teach and of not interfering in that role. And I think we've got the balance about right. Just have, uh, two short questions. Um, th the other one is uh, the interdisciplinary learning. And uh, when you were a mere uh, opposition spokesman, uh, Mr Russell, like, uh, like, like myself, uh, uh, sitting up the road listening to Peter Peacock uh, talking about uh, curriculum for excellence, uh, although I wasn't involved, I was really impressed at this idea that what you learned in one subject, the skills that you picked up in one subject, you could apply to others. And I really thought that was quite innovative and exciting. However, the evidence uh, and the submissions that we've had, and we spoke about it last week, and the RSE also mentioned it, was really that there's been such a focus, almost an obsession on exams, that we've lost the interdisciplinary learning. And uh, I just wonder this year, now that you're looking at reducing the, tackling the bureaucracy, et cetera, you know, can we get back to the basic principles of curriculum for excellence, uh, the confident learner, responsible citizen, effective contributor? Because I think that's something we would all want to see. And I don't think any of us want to see that basic ethos lost. I don't think it has been lost. Again, you know, I know Keir Bloomer has been a strong voice in the IOC evidence, uh, and and I think perhaps you know his his strong affection for CFE uh, perhaps blinds him a little to to actually what is going on in classrooms. There's no loss of interdisciplinary le learning. Uh, you know, interdisciplinary learning is at the heart of CFE, uh, and if you go to any school at any time, you will see how inter interdisciplinary learning works. I am absolutely supportive of a reduction in exam pressure, uh, you know, th but the, the, the desire to see exam results doesn't come, you know, solely from me. Um, it comes from a range of parents, perhaps even people around this table, who, who want to make sure that exam results are solid and, and respectable and, and used to, uh, for, to mark progress and to get into jobs and to do other things. So... There's a balance to be struck there, but if this committee wants to recommend and support you know, the, the, a continuing reduction in the pressure of exam and inspection, two big issues at the start of this process, uh, you won't find me an enemy of that in the slightest. It did come up in evidence last week. It's, yes. not, it's not something that I made up, and it, no, no, it, no, it, has, it, has, it has come up. And, and, and I, I agree with you. I, I, I think I it's agree. a reasonable... We should do something about it. Thank you. I'm pleased that we're on the same page we are. there. But you'll have to, if I might just say, it, 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 you will have to support that when the pressure comes on, you know, from people who say there should be more exams. I will have to support that. Well, you know, this I've always question. supported curriculum Ex for no, no. excellence. You get so the point. I don't it's have a, to do anything. It's a serious else. point. Anyway. It's a serious point. Yeah. You know, and you, I'm sure you, you, know, you and I go back a long way. You, Indeed, you will understand yes. this. There is a pressure often from people who say, we want more exams, we have to have this exam and that exam. Anybody in politics who says, I would like to reduce the pressure of exams or inspections, immediately finds himself up against you know, a lobby which says, oh, no, no, we've got to have more inspections, we've got to have more exams. So the point is simply, if, if people believe that there should be fewer exams and less exam pressure, it, it is necessary for them to stand up for that when the equal and opposite pressure arises. 
Well, I would like to think that we don't have to reduce things in order to help young people to be confident in their aspirations, and I think we all share that. My final uh, point, and uh, it was raised by Jane Baxter, and um, we seem to keep talking about exams all the time, and I'm sure you've read the evidence from last week, but uh, you know, given the commitment all around this table for the, the Wood Commission, we want that to work so well. Uh, I, and although you did respond to, to Jane, I'm not actually finding that dovetail between CFE and uh, the Wood Commission. I, I'm, I'm not finding that easy. And I think the second point is uh, how how are you working with FE colleges to ensure that the opportunities that they can offer, uh, as well as what's offered in schools, um, you know, for taster, modern apprenticeships or whatever, uh, how are you making sure that the further education colleges are given or that pupils at school are given the opportunity to uh, pick up modern apprenticeships uh, and experience at the further education colleges. How do they fit into all this? Well, they, they fit integrally into what we're trying to do. Um, Wood couldn't really succeed without CFE, without the flexibility that exists in CFE. Uh, the opportunity for divergent paths to be taken... And, and, and a range of opportunities to be added on uh, to the offer and to be there as alternatives. And, you know, I think the really significant thing about Wood is not that it simply says uh, that there should be a phrase I don't like particularly, parity of esteem between vocational and non and academic qualifications, because I think that, that that doesn't say the right thing, but that the range of opportunities should be wide, and that range of opportunities should always include the opportunity of vocational as well as academic qualifications. Now, the, the system we have developed with CFE is a system that allows that to happen. So that's the first thing. The second thing is there is an issue about you know, making sure that a broad general education is not narrowed unduly. Uh, you know, and that's what we're trying to do with the 3 plus 3 model. So when we're talking about young people at school entering into modern apprenticeships, we have to make sure that that model works in terms of the broad general education. Now, the, the Wood recommendations are clear on this. We can see how they're going to work. The third issue there is the partner in delivering those has to be the FE system. It's quite obvious. You know, uh, quite clearly, the FE system has a major role to play in delivering those vocational qualifications, because it does it already. You know the system well. The system does it already. It is key we are keen to do that. Now, we got into a bit of confusion uh, in six or seven years ago with, with what was happening. Local authorities were trying to do things with young people in colleges, and colleges were trying to do things with schools, and it got confused. We're much clearer now about what the relationship would be and, and, and would, can lay that out even more clearly to make sure that colleges have a role to play in supporting young people in vocational qualifications without interfering with the broad general education that takes place. So uh, I, I'm, I, I was pleased that Terry Lanigan again last week in his evidence drew attention to the fact that this is moving fast and it is moving fast to get uh, pilot projects into place to make sure that this is happening in places across the country. And as that develops... I think we'll see a, a rapid change. OK. I'll, I'll just leave it there. Thank you. Um, uh, John McAlpine. Thank you very much, Convener. Good morning, Cabinet Good morning. Secretary. I, I was going to ask you about um, opportunities for sharing best practice, but you answered that quite extensively um, to my colleague Gordon MacDonald, so I'm therefore going to ask something completely different. Um, one of the government initiatives that was introduced at the same time as Curriculum for Excellence was rolling out and has been affected by Curriculum for Excellence was the commitment to Scottish studies in schools. And uh, obviously that's a very popular um, initiative. I think it's about 80% of people in Scotland believe that their children should learn more about their own culture. And there was a big debate, as you know, about whether it should be taught as a separate stream, as I believe it's taught, say, in Norway, but it was decided because of Curriculum for Excellence that it should be interdisciplinary, so Scottish studies should run throughout all subjects. And I just wondered um, how that was going and uh, what monitoring was happening in terms of uh, the effectiveness of introducing Scottish studies across the curriculum. Well, Bill is the one with the most, uh, in terms of inspection, who will be able to tell us how it goes. Um, I'm sure you've got some general information, but I'm happy also to make sure that you're written to with detailed information on numbers and, and presentations and things. 
Sure, I, and certainly we could get you some more specific information, feedback from our inspections, but I'm, I'm absolutely convinced that embedding it across the curriculum is the right way to go, and it, indeed many elements of uh, traditionally schools, primary schools and also secondary schools would embed elements of uh, Scottish studies across different subjects in the curriculum where that fitted. Also, it makes a very good context for interdisciplin interdisciplinary learning, as was uh, raised earlier. So we do see it uh, happening in schools. We are very active in, in reference to your previous potential question at sharing best practice across the country uh, from what we see best in inspection. So we will be continuing to do that. But uh, I'm happy to provide you with some How much of, of a priority is it given? Because obviously you can understand even the, the, the kind of the, the complexion of the um, discussion today, quite understandably, there's a big focus on things like physics and languages and pre preparation for apprenticeships and that kind of thing. And that's totally understandable. Um, but is there a danger that because of that, that Scottish studies, I mean, it's certainly not been, I haven't been aware of it as part of the general discussion around curriculum for excellence uh, recently. It is up to us to, 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 to have a hierarchy of subjects mm -hmm. in schools. You know, um, what it is up to us is to make sure that the offer is wide and that the offer is appropriate so that people have the options that they need to have and as many of them as possible. But I think it is really up to schools, it is up to young people, it's up to parents to, to show an interest and to take these up. Um, I would want to make sure that it was widely available. I think that is, is our job, and I think the evidence is that it's becoming more widely available. Um, and I would want to make sure that people knew it existed. Uh, I think people then have to make draw conclusions of their own about how they're going to take it up. Uh, you know, I would like to have done it, but that doesn't necessarily mean that everybody will want to do it. I'm, I'm quite surprised at what you say there, but you're basically saying it's optional. I thought it was government policy that it was... Well, everything, everything is optional in Scottish education, uh, I think, with, with the exception of religious observance in, 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 in secondary schools. Um, everything is optional in that regard. I, I don't want to diminish its importance. You know I'm an enthusiast for it. But equally, I don't want to say that this is you know, a subject that we're promoting over and above other subjects. I want a very, very wide range of subjects to be available. I think Scottish studies is a great thing. I would like to see pupils take it. And I think that we should continue to offer it at a growing level so that in actual fact, you can go to do higher, you can go and do advanced hires, you can do a range of things in it. But it is one of the options. Do you not think it, as well that it goes further than just being another subject because uh, it's, it's, it's core to young people's self-esteem, particularly young working class young people. For example, if you look at language, working class young people speak in Scots. If, if their language is legitimated through the academic curriculum, that will improve their self-esteem and will actually go th right through the whole curriculum. And I would hope that that would be the case and I would hope any school would make sure that they legitimise all um, use of Scots or, or, or in a school, whether or not those pupils are taking Scottish studies. You know, that Scots is, is, is a language and should be recognised as such, and I would hope that we have gone well past the days where pupils get punished for speaking the language, uh, uh, essentially, of the community, whether it be Scots or Gaelic. So, so does that mean that Scots will get parity with Gaelic, then? Well, well Scots, is, Scots remains an important part of this study, Parity, of course it is parity because it's a language. You know, in terms of expenditure and p public policy and how that policy is put in place, Gaelic uh, presently has more attention, but there are good historical reasons for that. Thank you. Jane Baxter. <clears throat> Thank you. I'd just like to ask about resources, Cabinet Secretary, um, and also to acknowledge the, the, the achievement of teachers and pupils and everybody else involved in the curriculum, curriculum for excellence in this year's results. But um, last week, Larry Flanagan said that that was not sustainable. Um, and then Jane Peckham said that teachers still feel extremely anxious about the next phase. And Richard Goring said there's a lot of apprehension and anxiety about th that. Um, so I wonder if you think that resources play a part in reducing those fears and anxieties and building teachers' confidence. Um, and in particular, I wondered if there was issues about um, resourcing teachers across the different education authorities and, and teacher numbers. But then given what you said a couple of minutes ago about colleges, that made me wonder if there was an issue about college resourcing as well and 
what you said about the Wood Commission and it's setting out how it's going to take this forward. Are we looking at additional resources? Well, I, I don't want to anticipate the budget, clearly, and that would, I wouldn't be able to do so, right? But the commitment was given by the government to resource the Wood Commission, and that commitment will be honoured. Um, equally, you know, we are, there, is, there are strong financial pressures in the system. But on every occasion, I have been able to add additional resource, uh, both to colleges and to Curriculum for Excellence, I have done so. In terms of teacher numbers, you know, I'm very keen that we maintain and, if possible, expand teacher numbers. I, I think you know, we have an agreement with COSLA on teacher numbers, which requires to be honoured. I don't think there is a case to be made for reducing teacher numbers in Scotland. Um, I hear it occasionally from lo local authorities. I don't think that that case is a valid case. Um, in those circumstances, I would like, where possible, to be able to invest more. But, you know, I am also operating under the present constraints of the present constitutional settlement and the present financial settlement. Uh, and that is a difficult thing always to do. It's something we're going to cover more as we scrutinise the budget, so we'll, mm. we'll return to that subject. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, Neil? Just on the issue of resources as well, a teacher contacted us through... Facebook and Twitter, they said the implementation of the new curriculum has been done at a time when local authority budgets have been cut. The knock-on effect is reduced staff training and resources in the classroom for the people that are delivering the curriculum. I, along with many of my colleagues, spend much of our own money funding some of the gaps. There are also cases of tri-level teaching as the staff are not available to run national three, four, five or national five and higher courses separately. Is the government planning on making available extra resources to allow teachers to, to deliver the described curriculum? Well, the reduction in local authority uh, education budgets between 12, uh, 11, 12 to 12, 13 was 0 0.8 per cent. I fight very hard to maintain local authority education budgets, but it is within the context of enormous financial pressure on the Scottish budget settlement, uh, and that remains the case. I have repeatedly said that there is always a difficulty and bound to be a difficulty in introducing major reform at a time of falling resources, but we have done, I think, remarkably well with the resource, and that means every teacher has done remarkably well with the resource. And, of course, I would welcome an opportunity to increase that resource. Uh, it is not an opportunity that will now be available through full control of the Scottish financial resources, unfortunately, uh, as would have happened with independence. But we need to make sure that we have stronger financial control in Scotland so that we can make these decisions. Um, and, of course, we wouldn't be assisted if local authorities reduced educational expenditure. Thank you, Matt. Just a final question, Cabinet Secretary, if I may. Um, what do you believe this year's experience um, of the Curriculum for Excellence and obviously the National Unit, National Qualifications, what does it suggest about the degree to which the original aspirations of CFE um, have actually been realised in practice? I think that we've done very well to realise, if you go back to the ten points that I raised at the beginning, that arose out of the the, the inquiry into the future of Scottish, uh, the principles of uh, Scottish education, and I really would commend that sheet of paper to you, which is quite fascinating. It is astonishing, in my view, how many of those have either been achieved or are in the process of being achieved, and those are the underlying purposes of CFE. CFE was built upon them as, as the foundations. Um, I think we've been honest to a great deal of it. Now, of course, Mary Scanlon has correctly raised issues such as examination pressure. Other members have referred to assessment. Those are things which, you know, accrue in any process of change. I mean, they're a bit like barnacles that they begin to grow on the system. We have to be pretty ruthless about saying we don't want those things to grow on it and we want to remain true to these principles. But all of us have to remain true to those principles. You know, it's not enough just to say, well, is the minister remaining true to the principles or is, you know, Education Scotland remaining true to the principles? You know, we have to remain true to them as politicians because we... We, 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 we decided upon those principles at the beginning. We have to remain true to them as political parties, opposition and, and government, so that we are collaborating on them. We have to remain true to them across the education system and local authorities have to remain true to them. Schools have to remain true to them and individual teachers have to remain true to them. Now, I think we've done pretty well in that regard, but we could always do better. And perhaps we should renew our, if I may use a much used word, vow, uh, to make sure that we are committed to them and that we do think this is the right direction for Scottish education. And we shouldn't be looking for failure, we should be working for success. Well, thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. I certainly hope it will be stronger than a vow, but uh, we shall see. Uh, vows are strong if they're, if they're, if they're met. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for your attendance today, and of course to your supporting officials, Fiona and Bill. Thank you very much for coming along.
there, there may well be issues that we wish to write to you about, um, but we'll have a look at that after we've reviewed, the, ev if reviewed the evidence, Cabinet much. Secretary. Uh, that concludes our business for today, and I close the meeting.